and the it is timeless. Yep. It is as if it was yesterday. Oh, here's something else too. I don't know if I showed you this. This came from Romania. So yeah. this is uh, an article I wrote. They put oh, it into a Romanian journal. You know, during the Civil War, three Romanian women came there. To Dubrovnik? Yeah. It didn't even tell. Wonderful. Congratulations. Boy, we are productive here. Working all the time. Yeah. I do. I think you wrote this. Huh? I don't think you wrote this. Yeah, but I'm the other one. You're not. I don't think you wrote the The Romanian one <laughs> looks like screwed up Italian to me, yeah. <laughs> so then we can sell by two. This one and this one. Sure. Okay, here's one. That is the thing which just came out in form. And Dustin has something in there. I have something in there. It's on the next page where you can. It's up there. Yeah, it's from social psychology. That's the article they didn't believe us, right? Right. That we get the right stuff. Theory of religion. Called the X experience in the city of being. Oh, very good. And then from notion of the prophet and the priest. Very good, Dustin. Now, how much do they want to have? $32? 32, yeah. It's not so bad, right? So, you have to just email um, Robert Lake, the mm -hmm. email he sent you, and tell him, give him your address, and then he'll send you a copy of it. Okay. So he doesn't have my address, though. He sent that to all the contributors. Oh, well, Dustin, you have the, the whole catastrophe violence of the 20th century. Sure. How do you compare that with the, the, the data that looks and goes, listen, we're, we're, we're killing people significantly less than we ever have. And, we're and yeah, in the 20th we century, a hell of a lot less violence. Yeah. Say, I mean, times like Genghis Khan or whatever. Yeah, where violence was something every day yeah, around you. You're just going to die. Right, yeah. exactly. So the 20th century is quite, I mean, the World War One and Two were quite aberrations, you yeah. know, in that sense. So. But how does, does that not run a little contradictory to what you're saying? Partly. Yeah. <laughs> and I wrote it one time, probably read another, I think I read Stephen Pinker's book, and it convinced me of the opposite. So, But that's what happens when they take two years to publish something you wrote, you know. Okay. You change your mind in the meantime. You have a right to change your mind. Exactly. As long as you admit it, you're good. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's start the day, wherever these other people are. We hope that they will not lower their grades by not being here. But they still have a chance. Um, here is a social psychology and social processes um, announcement. And you can look that through, what is going on in social psychology. And most of the books are by, written by, well, there is a PhD. Uh, Thank you. I thought there were a lot of medical doctors in there. No, they are PhD. I didn't see it right. Okay. So you can look at this. Uh, we don't have social psychology in our department now anymore. I heard the last guy right. went. Right. Left uh, we still offer it. Who so offers it? Uh, so so Western does. But it's, it's put together with tape and glue. And uh -huh. People being brought in to teach for a small amount of time. And oh, grad oh, students. And so it still exists on the books. Yeah. We still offer the degree, but... Oh, it's still on the books. Yeah. Okay. So we still offer the classes. They're just taught yeah. by a changing number of people. Okay. Let me see. So, this is our syllabus. Let's see who is not here. Altamimi, right, is not here. So that we... Okay. And Al-Sunaidi is also not here. Did you want to, you want to say something today, right? Yes, I spoke to present. Yeah, one, wonderful, yeah. That's the I'm very concerned. I'm presenting on the same society, and you just have a yeah. paper <laughs> No, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> Two, John. I two years ago, I, I don't remember anything. Two, John. That'd be a refresher. <laughs> no, we don't mind. Uh, we don't mind any doubling up. Then James Hatzik, he uh, he did something last time, right? No. No. He was supposed to do it today. Oh, oh, oh. Who did it the last Simon time? Did. Simon did. Simon okay. Did Simon. That's what Simon looks like. Those pictures, they are not right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, very good. Maybe we can ch change it. I well, hope they haven't had a pretty good presentation. Still coming. Okay. I haven't read the book. I haven't read that one either. Yeah, no. Uh, so I here are the papers. 
But if nobody could be lying, I've never heard the book either. Also, <laughs> yeah. Naidi is not here, so we cannot say anything about it. Then we have here Alta Mimi. Now they know that we are going on, right? They didn't think it was the end, no. No, because, no, no. yeah, they, they know that. They made it perfectly clear, yeah, right? James Hattick. This one, okay. Okay. You got yours already, right? Yes, I got mine. Very good. Last week. Okay, here's the test, and here are some of our contemporary issues which we want to discuss today. By the way, I got maps about, you know, we have to make a decision if we go to Yalta there, and I have maps about it. I've never seen such beautiful maps. Maps? Yeah, maps, you know, about the crisis now. I mean, where well, things... Well, like, like a timeline or something? Or? No, no, I mean real maps. Real I mean, maps? Yeah. Oh, where real maps. Where yeah, where something is, and uh, we can mm. look at it, uh, you know, because this is even not only theory, this is praxis. Yeah. Where we will put our... I got an email from Dasha. Oh, I asked she her doing? about it, and she said that everyone is very happy. She knows a few ethnic Ukrainians who are thinking about moving out to moving out of the Crimea. Really? Um, but she said the vast majority of people she knows are very happy. Yeah. And she said there is quote unquote a long line for the sausage, <laughs> <laughs> which she, she remarked that that was an old Soviet saying it means. There's a long line to get your paperwork done or whatever, so get your citizenship and your yeah. Russian passport, but there's a long queue, long queue for the sausage, she says. Uh -huh. <laughs> Otherwise, she said everyone's very, very friendly, very happy, everyone's yeah. very peaceful. Yeah, why not? I mean, but what we have to discuss is the next act, mm -hmm. and that is the east part, because there are three cities which are in uproar. Yeah, so and and they there. want to have a republic. No. And so, so here's the dialectics of religion. That is another one which is coming out there. That is for Dubrovnik. That's our Dubrovnik page. Boy, we are really productive. That that that's Mike's. It's Mike's, yeah. Okay. But I think it will take to fall. Yeah, he said somewhere in the fall. Okay. Now that one I wrote three years ago. So I don't remember nothing. <laughs> With my car? You're going to pick it up once you get it and read it. Go, what is this? This is lying. It's a big yeah. That's really into propaganda at that time. So, uh. <laughs> Let me see the. I had it. Where did it go? There's such beautiful maps there. No, where was that actually? That might have been longer than that. 2010. You go on with your discourse. I will. I will try to find it. So well, that was four years ago that I wrote this one. Oh my god, what is that thing on the front cover? It's art. Is that what that is? <laughs> I guess so. The picture of the cover, my, I love it. Oh, so you loved it, so I better not say anything critical about it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Bite your tongue. Well, the, la the last one, I really liked the last cover he did because he painted a picture of himself as a court jester. And that became yeah. the, the front cover. <laughs> that was really strange. <laughs> Good. Who was it, my guy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, big. Yeah, he had the hat, you know, those little things with little okay. bells on it and whatnot, and <laughs> <laughs> a little ruffled neckwear and everything. That's hilarious. Yeah. Well, I, I see him at the uh, the the. the oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. wonderful. Oh, oh yeah, so. I can imagine I'm so happy for every soul <laughs> appearing. Where? It's strange. I've worked so hard on this on this map there. Is it on your desk? Huh? Is it on your desk? No. No. I don't think so. We can look there. Yeah. But I want under all circumstances I want to show that to you. Okay. I saw something. Did they actually move on the eastern part yet, or are they still just putting No, it no, it's just a on the board. process to... It was the New York Times. I, I can get it out once more. Yeah, I'll see it. Can you get the New York Times? 
It's on the... Uh, on the computer? Yeah. It was in the New York Times, and maybe we can put... Oh, oh we cannot print it out, I think. Not yet. We cannot print it out. It's, uh, so... Okay, that's this. Okay, well, then we cannot get it, but we have to discuss it without it. Okay, here is the book which has just come out. Where are you? Uh, which we just published about from. Thank you. Okay. Oh, boy. <coughs> this is frustrating. Frustrating when people are just walking away. Ha! 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 It did not walk away. It's here. Okay. Okay. Mm. You can close it up again. Okay, we can look at this. You almost thought you'd be overproductive. <laughs> yeah. I just fell into despair almost. I became nihilistic. I gave up on the world. Like Mike, my, my friend. Oh. I always fight for his soul. I want to rescue his soul. But he does all this administrative stuff, you know. That's the soul killer. He, he, whole weeks he wants to rescue a guy, everybody wants to wants not to give him tenure, and now he stubbornly wants to give him tenure anyway. <laughs> Mike doesn't have tenure? No, not he, oh. or somebody else. Oh, okay. So, you know, he's on some kind of a committee, and uh. and they all have decided against him. Now you, you know that he don't come through anymore. If the provost and all these people, you know, have decided that you cannot get tenure, then yeah. just one vote, one vote. Okay, very good. This is 12 today, um, and Productive Relations and Productive Forces is the title. Uh, I gave the thing back. No, I didn't give yours back yet, right? Um, where, is, where is your paper? I must not lose the whole thing again. Okay. Can you take some of the papers with you to your friends? in case they are not coming. Okay. Well, take yours out anyway. Do you find it? Yes. Okay. Okay, do, do you know uh, the others? Are you in contact with them? Uh, yeah, they didn't know, uh, James didn't know how to get hold of them. Okay, so you have yours, right? Yeah, and I have the uh, magic also. Okay. Yeah, okay. Can you give it to him? Good. Okay. Wonderful. Oh, we settled this. Okay. Test number three. We don't have any test number three. Instead of that, we have a presentation. Now we have one today. Do you have one? No. Next week. Next week. Yeah, next week. So we have one today. Very good. And uh, then uh, last class will be on the 16th. So that is next week. That's I won't be here, though. It'll be the okay. my first absence. You go where? I have a oh. an award ceremony I have to okay. be at okay. campus. Very so. good. Okay, we'll miss you. I would rather be here, so. Yeah, I know. I'll be here in spirit. You have to do your duty. Exactly. Okay, so that is 16th, and then we want to have all our presentations, then, whoever still has a presentation. Okay, then we had an excursion yesterday, which was very interesting. We have this uh, in Three Rivers. One shouldn't believe it, but. There is a monastery, and um, a Benedictine monastery, Anglican one, and there is a Roman Catholic one in Chicago. And the only difference is that the Chicago one has a school still, and they don't have a school here, but they may have one someday. But uh, it is a tremendous historical type of a thing, so it goes back to Oxford, that's where they came from, and they came here in the 30, 30, 1934 or so before they were in Indiana, so came from Indiana and so on, and they were scholars in uh, in Oxford, and many of them joined monasteries in England, and then some came over here. As a matter of a bunch of Americans went over there to study, and then they came back here and founded those monasteries. It's unbelievable, you know, strange, so out in the wilderness there, bought a little farmhouse, and now it's quite a complex there. <laughs> and. Um, before that, of course, in the 19th century, there was a romantic movement. We mentioned romanticism a lot. So
So Romanticism means to go back to the good old times. So um, the Romantic movement went back to the Middle Ages, and then they made a strange discovery. When you think of dialectics, determined negation, they really thought that the Protestant paradigm determ uh, negated the Catholic paradigm too abstractly. That means they didn't reserve enough. And so they discovered this monasticism and uh, renewed it. So it was from, from uh, Henry VIII, the 16th century to the 18th century, 200 years or so, there was nothing. Monks were just sent out, and there were some Protestant monasteries where rich girls from rich families, Protestant families now, they, they made sure that these monasteries went on because they didn't want their daughters suddenly being nowhere or whatever. So there were some Protestant monasteries, but very few. So otherwise, all the poverty went to the state. And so they discovered the rule again of Benedict, which goes back to the 6th century, to Monte Cassino, which the Americans bombed out in the Second World War, and then it is restored now. So unbelievably long tradition, and, and that goes back even to the century. In the 3rd century, the more the Church adapted to the Roman state up to Constantine, the more there were some people who thought that Christianity was getting lost that mainstream Christianity was phony. And therefore they wanted to have a radical one, and first they stood on pillars in the Egyptian desert, and then they made communities. And in the east, east we have one in Russia, we have Basileus order, and then we had innumerable ones in the west, and that is <coughs> one part of it there. So, And it's important for the students that they are confronted, you know, with people who have this background. First of all, they were religious, because they know no religious people. And uh, it was uh, somehow strange. I mean, I had a strange feeling about this this group who was there. Uh, I th when they entered the monastery, I had the feeling that they lost ground. They didn't know where the hell they were anymore. They were somehow struck of this whole thing, that the monastery, the dining room, and, and the monk, and, and all the monks, uh, the celebrated some prayers, they prayed the psalms, and so on. And it was eerie somehow. It's a dark church, and uh, they they lost their orientation or whatever. They walked around like little zombies or whatever. So, But the Father Williams was very good. He was not at his best there, but he studies all the time, so he can, you know, give the whole tradition. But things like that they take these vows, you know, vow of chastity in the porno society, that they have no poverty, that they are communists in a, in a society which is mad as far as money is concerned. They, they have obedience, that means they don't play the power game which uh, corrupts everybody. So it's, it's another world, you know. And, uh, and they are walking around, <laughs> living people are not stuffed out somewhere in a museum or whatever, they are really living people. And so um, it, it, it's the first time, but it's always, always strange, but this time, I think it was it was a shock for the people somehow. They they looked strange to me, but maybe I looked strange, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> no less. Okay, that was our visit there. And then uh we have our last uh, Saturday meeting. Next Saturday, whoever wants to come you're very much invited for our uh, for our round table meal there. And then I told you already there is summer one, it's filling up, the ministry is almost full, and then whenever it's full, when they are 50, then they open up for 60, and so there's no end to it or whatever. But whoever, if you know somebody who may be interested in psycho psychological elements and religion, psychology of religion, you can tell them of this online course. And then in fall, we have this uh, religion and revolution thing, and I think I told you already that there was a publisher there who wants to have a textbook on religion and revolution. That's the only course of, with this title in the United States and in Canada. And somehow they want to have a textbook. I've never written a textbook. I never want to write a textbook. But I will see now, you know, what they want, what it looks like, or whatever. Because the critical theory has to be transformed in order to fit this uh, form as we have it online. So one has to somehow translate it without betraying it totally. And uh, I have to see if it, if it can be done. <laughs> okay, now then we have this issue of contemporary issue, and we can take that up, which we had. So what we want to do is to see the critical theory at work, 
the critical theory at work in time diagnosis, time prognosis, and so on. And we have that already. We talked about the Ukraine, but this is a continuing process. So um, let's just look uh, about what is going on. We know that the critical theory is interdisciplinary, so it uh, can connect itself. That was the plan from the very beginning of our kind of in Frankfurt. So it connects with political science, it connects with history, it connects with economics, and uh, so it is a core theory, but it, uh, as Hegel did already, it works together with all the positive sciences. So there's Ukraine crisis in maps, it says, and so uh, I just want to mention a few things. We, when we do the time diagnosis, we have to come from outside, of course. We have to, from the surface, so we have to be superficial. We have to have the anchor men, and they are all superficial. I mean, we said, you know, we mentioned already that Hegel called everybody superficial, <laughs> and people were upset about this. So, whoever could not think dialectically was superficial. So, all our positivists would be superficial, and the uh, somehow positivism uh, really emphasizes superficiality on purpose. So that means you look at the surface, you learn to observe and to quantify and then to put it in statistics and so on and so on. You never want to go into the depth. When you go into the depth, it sounds mystical and so on. They don't, don't, they don't trust universals. Uh, they are nominalists. And so so um, but therefore, it is is okay. So one starts from the surface and doesn't start dialectically, uh, but simply collecting data or names or what just uh, comes up. So here is this map there, and there is uh, Charkov, Charkov, and so on. There is one city there, um, and that is very famous from the Second World War. There were big tank battles there where the Germans won once there, and they heard it every day in, in, the, in the news when I was in the office at school. And then there is Lubansk there, too, and then there is Dontek, in these three cities. And then is another one here. That is, uh, it's hard to read there, I cannot read so, so much with D. But there, upheavals have t taken place so recently. So people went on the barricades and uh, called out the, um, announced the uh, Republic, independent Republic of uh, the Ukraine and so on. So, independent from, and here on, on the other side, you have then Kiev and you have Odessa there. Odessa is famous, you know, there's a movie, Odessa because there was a secret SS club after the war um, of SS men who met continually and carried on the old spirit and so on. They had the name Odessa. And Kiev is up here. So if they split off there, there will be only one third of the Ukraine will be left. left. The other two thirds will become an independent state. Now, uh, to look at a few things now, um, we know that the critical theory takes capitalism as a focus point. So Horkheimer would say, one well, cannot talk about war, one cannot talk about concentration camps about, uh, without talking about capitalism and so on and so on. So capitalism is a focus point. So, but there is no report about all that which mentions, mentions capitalism. So, but you have to make then connections where you then go into the depth a little bit. So um, for instance here in the in this place there, which I cannot read here, Tripopops, uh, can you read that? Yes. This place. Nipropetovsk. Uh, okay, believe it, believe it. Reading is not a problem. Place X there, place X. Okay, in this place X there, there is a rabbi. And this rabbi uh, has a sister in New York. So uh, the sister is in New York and she is frightened about Nazism. And when she says Nazism, she thinks right away anti-Semitism. So our press right away took that up because the brother who lives in this mysterious place he <laughs> wrote to her, you know, there were no Nazis and there was no anti-Semitism and everything was fine. So. But then, as now it comes, when you see where the ugly head suddenly comes through, there is an oligarch. And we don't call capitalists oligarchs here. We don't even call them plutocrats. That's what they are. But they call them, uh, they call them this uh, oligarchs. So, oligarchs.
Goi are the few arcane meaning. So the few dominate. They are not aristocrats because aristos means good. The few are good. So when you say oligarchs, they are not good. They are just there. So now this synagogue has an oligarch, <laughs> a billionaire. Uh, so you have to get all, the whole story together. This billionaire does not want to be included into the Russian Federation because the Russian Federation, you know, they let they let oligarchs live for a little while, but sometimes they also put them into, into prison or whatever. As a matter of fact, they sometimes even pardon them. Putin has pardoned one a month ago, so, but it is a precarious existence. So, so therefore, he does not want to go into the Russian Federation, so he is on our side. He wants to go to the European Union because that is where he can go on being a billionaire or become more than a billionaire, whatever that is. So, um, so there's the synagogue. They have their own Jewish billionaire, and he doesn't want to go to, uh, to, to Russia. And he says there is no Nazism and so on, in spite of the fact that, of course, in Kiev, a synagogue which was just finished in 2012 was burned down at the place where the Jews were collected by the Nazis to be put to death or to be gassed or to be shot in the quarry. In the quarry. There's a quarry 30 miles from Kiev where about 38,000 of them were, were shot and so on. And that was the place where they, where they are there. So. Now that goes together, so we see now how, uh, you know, sometimes you think when we have maps or when we have pictures, that is the truth, you know, when, when photo photography came up, people said, now we get to the truth. But you can also manipulate uh, pictures and, and uh, whatever, so that's to be very careful. Now that comes together with uh, the Russians in Moscow who say that this thing was Nazism down there. Uh, what broke out. So neoliberalism in combination with Nazism and that there was anti-Semitism at the same time. So um, one has to see that what we want to say is the sister was afraid of that, the sister believed Putin's propaganda, but her brother is there, is a rabbi, and the rabbi is not afraid of anti-Semitism. There's no Nazism and so on. So also on May 9th, when was that, when is that? On May 9th, the German troops of, on the Eastern Front capitulated. So they will uh, will celebrate this. So the Russians will celebrate this. But large parts of the Ukraine belong to SS division uh, and uh, were not so entirely clear on the side of Stalin or whatever. And so that the whole thing has a historical background. So everywhere they will celebrate that as a Russian victory over Nazism, and this Nazism has now come back again, or it is in process of coming back again. Now, you have to look at, at something else now. See, now we are moving from the surface there a little bit somewhere else, because in 1989, the uh, neoliberals, and there was no talk about Nazism at that time, but the neoliberals made this counter-revolution. We don't think about that at all that way. So, and it was the third counter-revolution, because the first one was in the 20s, when 12 capitalistic armies marched um, uh, to, into Russia, and uh, then they were beaten by Lenin, and there are still 8,000 soldiers in, in Murmansk. So we were, from the very beginning, we were counter-revolutionaries. But you have a revolution and you counter it, then you are counter-revolutionary. The only way how you can say that's not true is that you say there has been no revolution. Because if there wasn't any revolution, then you cannot have a counter-revolution. That is for clear. But then, you know, the capitalistic uh, people, the, the, that means these, uh, what do we call, these oligarchs, the, the Western oligarchs, you know, the background that Hitler, you know, was related to Ford and to, uh, to, the, to the banks, to all the banks of France, and here they were putting MIT, and so on and so on. So, and, and that Hitler was an employee of Krupp and Thyssen and so on. So that was the second counter-revolution. It almost worked. That's what Hitler and the people said. We almost made it, you know, in Stalingrad. And that is over here there. It is now Volgograd. So then they were beaten there by Shukov, and they were beaten uh, another time in, in Kursk there, which is almost east of Moscow. And, uh, and then they were beaten in Berlin. So that was the end. So there were two counter-revolutions which have lost, have been lost. But the third one, 
were successful. And now Putin says that this was the worst thing which ever happened in Russian history. And we are horribly upset about this because we are so happy that we finally have a counter-revolution which worked. So now he thinks that happy counter-revolution, you know, was the worst what ever happened. And that is indicative. I mean, that says something now. So um, it is something which should not have happened, but it happened. And there is the rollback now. That means this counter-revolution is coming to its end. But in Kiev a month ago and so on, they tried once more to renew it, to stabilize it, to carry, to bring the Ukraine back to the to the European Union and so on. So now they think that fascism there is this attempt, this time the attempt to connect the Ukraine with the European Union. What does the European Union have to do with fascism? It's certainly not fascist. It's more social democratic or whatever. So, but all the countries which belong to the European Union marched with Hitler into Russia, three million of them, from Holland, from Spain, from Portugal, from Italy, everywhere. This whole bunch which sits there now, and it's called the European Union, where the invaders, who on May 9th, 1945, capitulated. So you have to see what, in terms of revolution, counter-revolution, capitalism, and so on. So uh, there are, not only in that city, but in the other cities, there are also oligarchs, so these oligarchs would support an independent uh, Ukraine. They are not entirely opposed to that, but they don't want to be enter the Russian Federation because then the Duma makes laws which will limit them. They cannot, uh, you know, make all that money which they otherwise would like to make. Let's see. Okay, so that as far as these little places are concerned now. Um, there is in Faropol, that is the capital, was the capital of the Crimea, and is now the capital. And we talked in a, in a university there, uh, and we know the poverty of the whole thing. And then there is Sebastopol here, and Sebastopol is the place where the Russian fleet is stationed. Now I can show you the Russian fleet from the air, so you have tremendous possibilities today. So when you see now here, the, the, there's the map, and it's not very clear, but it is those little things here which are colored in which at the present time people uh, try to undo the counter-revolution of 1989 and try to become a state and then also, forgetting about the, the, uh, the oligarchs, to join the Russian Federation. So that is the danger now that this will happen. And there are different options. You know, the most extreme option would be an invasion by the Russians but they have said they wouldn't do it. Another one is to get them under economic, Russia gets them under economic and political control, and there are now things where you can read Habermas, what he says about modern constitutions and so on. Putin wants Kiev to become a federate state, federation, which would mean that the governors here would become more independent if they become more independent, then Russia can influence them more. And even when Kiev would become pro-European and so on, then the governors would have power enough to resist it and would keep the whole thing in, in the Russian influence sphere. This thing. So you have, if you think of our roadmap, you know, the first thing there, we have internal state law, external state law, and the historical process. So the Russians have expressed their desire concerning the internal state law, the constitution, namely a confederate constitution and so on, and it is quite um, obvious that this is not only done in the name of the Ukraine, but that has something to do that with independent governors, you have a chance, you know, to eat one after the other up, or one governor after the other, if you don't make a rule that the confederate states cannot separate like it is here. So Michigan cannot lose, leave the Union, or Mississippi, and so on. In Yugoslavia, that was not the case, but they would like to make a constitution in which the, uh, the states can, um, the governors can leave if they want to. They have to pay a price, you know, whatever they got from Kiev, and but they can leave. So that, uh, so that is the. Then we have here um, the what the airports are. So um, we have. Uh, we have
have the harbors there. The Vastopol is the main harbor. We have a huge airport in uh, in uh, uh, Sinterpol. So all that will be activated now. Now here you have the harbor of the Vastopol here. So from from uh, from Yalta, we it's only a few miles to the Vastopol. Then we went there to the university. I made a treaty between the university and our university to have exchange. It is a highly developed technical type of university, engineering and so on. So I thought we could someday, you know, have an exchange of students with our um, thing there, our engineering school here and so on. So so here you can also, the uh, we have some battleships now in the Black Sea and they took pictures so they, they are parts of the Russian fleet are stationed here on both sides. That is the harbor of Sebastopol there. So if one wants to really discuss things then um, can you get it? That would be nice. So here you have all these air pictures because that is where the Russian power is concentrated. So you can really see the big battleships there and here too there are three of them, there are four or five and there are the entrance and so on. So they they cannot do anything. I mean our I think one one cruiser or whatever is there. Uh, they they cannot do they can only be symbolic or they make a maneuver with Romania now and uh, so, but they all know that they cannot do a thing. <laughs> and here we have uh, once more a map where we have Simferopol here, uh, Simferopol here, Sevastopol there, and Yalta here. And Yalta is where we always met. It's a wonderful place where the emperor, the Tsar, always went for vacations. Here you have the bigger Ukraine, and there you have Kiev, and there you have. Uh, um, Sebastopol, Sebastopol here, and there another Odessa in between there. So, so that is the Tadron. I'll let it give it to you now. You can look at it a little bit more. I think that is about all. So that, is, as far as the time diagnosis is concerned, one has to go then very much into the particular, right? So here is Moldova, which is another thing. In Moldova, we also have a majority of Russians there. So there is a similar development may take place. In Moldova, there. So they see themselves as Russians. Um, hmm? They see themselves as Russians. Well, uh, yeah, uh, yes, the same thing. You see, when, when Russia put all these things together, you know, the Russians went everywhere and anywhere. We have in Ukraine, in Yugoslavia too. You know, with Tito, you had suddenly Serbs in Croatia, and you had Croats in Slovenia, and uh, you had Croats in Serbia, and they intermarried and so on. And then when this, this political thing happens, then it disturbs everything, neighborhoods, and then we get the civil war, then it's really horrible. We have a tribal there, you know, who had a uh, had an orthodox wife, a Serbian wife. He was a court. She committed suicide. She just couldn't bear it. Now he has a Muslim wife, and um, and, and as soon as they leave there, the Croats will try to take the, uh, the Bosnian place there because that was just for show. They didn't want to have a Muslim state. So they put the Muslims together with the courts, and they will not stay together uh, if the NATO leaves. So, okay, and here you have again Sevastopol down here, and uh, and then they have Simferopol, there, the capital. So that is so that has happened already. That's already the past. So what one has to look for is now the eastern part of Ukraine, and that is you know that's time prognosis in Moldova. What will happen to that? And so it is obviously an attempt, you know, to heal the damage which the neoliberal counter-revolution has done. And the Europeans, I don't think we may have been in it in that upheaval a few weeks ago. I think the Europeans may have paid those uh, neoliberals and those fascists there uh, more than we did. And uh, and the attempt was, you know, to get the, the um, Ukraine into the European Union. And uh, both sides offered a lot of money, so $19 billion are needed for the Ukraine as a whole. The Russians offered things, and uh, when they didn't go the right way, the Russians withdrew their things, and so on. So it's going on day after day, and um, so what one has to expect now is that these forces, which want to have an independent republic, will, uh, there which we saw in these particularly three or four cities there, that they will continue to go for independence and will separate from Kiev, uh, but then they may hesitate to go into the Europe into the uh, uh, Russian Federation. 
they may stay outside of the oligarchs, you know, have the upper hand. And they, the oligarchs, by the way, are the governors of these places at the moment. So in one case, you have an oligarch who is in the synagogue, but they're strange oligarchs. And then you have oligarchs who have already political power. Like here, you know, they pay the elections and pay the presidents and everything. So there they, they go personally into it. Well, I have it too here. That's yeah, there was that's Yulia Timoshenko's party. Yeah. I mean, they, they put her in prison. Right. You know, and then after this whole thing, they let her out. It's her party that's pointing all these oligarchs as the governors exactly, of the yeah. regions yeah, of right, uh, Ukraine. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that, and then we also, we also have this um, uh, philosophical, historical philosophical, uh, his, I mean, philosophy of history, not philosophy of history, yeah, philosophy of history. Uh, which Benjamin, for instance, has, and which Adorno has, and Horkheimer has, but which Habermas doesn't have anymore. He replaced it with an evolutionary theory, which he got from Parsons. So, but if we look at from that point of view, uh, uh, philosophy of history, then of course what happens now is that the Slavic world is consolidating itself again, that it has established what we call a Monroe Doctrine. Our Monroe Doctrine is here, no foreign influence into the Americas. That is our zone, and they do the same thing over there now. So we know, you know, what the steps are which they will take, uh, but there are variations, and we can only hope that there will be no civil war. That is one possibility, like in, in, the, in Yugoslavia, and also that there will be no uh, invasion. So there are 40,000 troops at the border of the Ukraine, of the eastern Ukraine, uh, but we can only hope that they will not march. But if, for instance, these guys who sit on the barricades in these three cities, they um, wait, they, they had already tires there with fire in it or whatever, fire material in it, so uh, uh, they waited for an attack by the Ukrainian army, but it never came. So, um, so they were a little bit disappointed or whatever. So, but if this attack would come and some of these Russians would die, mm -hmm. then, I mean, uh, you know, Putin would be forced, practically, yeah. to enter, and everybody knows that, you know. Yes, then you said that this was going to be, the solution to this problem in the East is going to be cited in the next 24 hours. Yeah. He said that today. Uh, oh. And so he said it's either going to be decided through discussion or that they're sending the military in yeah. to the East. And then that's what Putin said, that... Yeah he reserves the right to intervene. You know, intervene to protect Russians. Right, yeah, yeah, right. So. I mean, that's a very old traditional way to think, and even from our analysis in the New York Times, uh, that, you know, he has almost no choice to do that as soon as there are several Russians, you know, on the barricades are hit, mm -hmm. um, he will march in, and then it will be decided to him. But can we... Can you address that? I mean, I feel we have this conversation about the Ukraine, and I think we, you, you've done a good job showing sort of the, you know, the biases and how we construct the media coverage in the United States and where mm -hmm. they're going. But I don't feel like you've addressed actually how we, we, we sort of frame the Putin regime. Because the Putin mm -hmm. regime, to me, at least to, to an extent, it seems it has such strong nationalist currency. I mean, yeah. it almost seems counter to the, it seems like a counter revolution to the counter revolution or the, the old time counter revolution of movement towards yeah. nationalism. Okay, when you have a revolution and then you have three counter revolutions, but when you stop the third one, of course, slightly you go back to the revolution again, right? But I know, that, but but to an extent, I feel like because the, the original the bourgeoisie revolution becomes a revolution, the counter revolution to 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 sort of nationalist right. uh, constructions, and then from there you have the the, the revolution towards. Um, Socialism with and the 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 counter revolution then there's towards the, the neoliberal revolutions, but I feel like it seems like you have the the, the counter revolutions now, but Putin seems almost a call back to an even older age because he's not moving towards the, and uh, maybe I'm wrong. And this is yeah. why I'm asking about the framing. Yeah, that's, that's very good. But I mean, you could say Petersburg, right? Mm -hmm. 1917, Lenin, and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, they went to Stalinism, and I don't think they want to go back to Stalinism and so on. So yeah. the, the question is, you know, he thinks that the victorious counter-revolution of 1989 was the worst what ever happened in Russian history. So there they want to roll that back. So they want to negate that counter-revolution, which means what now? It doesn't mean... 
necessarily that they go back to Lenin or whatever. You know? Yeah, that's where, where so are they going Korver, back? Yeah, where, where right. Yeah. Now, Gorbachev, you know, was a Leninist. I mean, he wanted to have a reformed Leninism. Or, and I think it will come out to some kind of a social democracy or some, not in the Russian sense, but uh, that was always the case, you know, under Gorbachev, that they didn't want to become capitalistic. They wanted to have a new socialism. And I think that new socialism, whatever that looks like, uh, may be it. So this new socialism may be uh, friendlier to civil society. Maybe it wants to take in some issues of civil society. That's why they let the oligarchs live. That's why we went there, because our cause is called religion in civil society. That means we were together with people who wanted in the Crimea uh, a civil society. That means a better banking system, better airports, Lufthansa airplanes, and so on and so on. And I think, but at the same time, like you have it in China in a certain sense, you know, you have a communistic government, which at the same time is very often open to n new ways, you know, to think, and they have set up certain zones, you know, where capitalists uh, can manage, you know, to show people this is how it works, do you want this, and so on. So uh, something like this, I think, uh, may may happen. Uh, but there is another, our, you know, this philosophy of history thing. I think he thinks very much, Putin, in, uh, well, what he calls, what does he call it? Uh, uh, what is it called? Asian, Euro-Asian Union. Euro-Asian Union. Under Slavic leadership, I would add to it. You know, that is his plan. And what that looks internally, you know, how to what extent it is capitalistic and the oligarchs are there, but uh, to what extent that will be controlled, to what extent the state will control, you know. Now, what he has done, uh, he has 70% uh, of populists behind him. Mm -hmm. Plus so the has, Russian uh, Communist Party and the Ukrainian yeah, Communist right. Party. So he has the right and the left uh, on his side. So, uh, and that is a very good uh, political capital, as they call this, you know. So whatever he will do now, he has to be careful that he will not lose that, use that capital well, and I think he will be very careful, and he has different options, you know, he may leave the Ukraine independent, but he strengthens his economic and his political influence, you know, through money and whatever, and so um, or it will be more radical, you know, a simple cut and a short civil war, hopefully, or Whatever. I don't know how strong the Ukrainian army is, but the uh, Europeans could throw their power into it. The NATO could march in or give them weapons or whatever. So, I mean, it could become a very dangerous thing yes. there. But they are all very dependent, you know, in terms of natural gas and oil and whatever. The Europeans have to be very careful. But we, too, we mentioned that already, you know, as long as we are in Afghanistan still, we use airspace and, and air, air, airports of the Russians, you know, to go into Afghanistan in order to have a shorter way, so it makes it much cheaper for us. So we don't want to lose that neither, you know. We don't want to lose their help in uh, in, in Syria neither, and, uh, and we don't want to lose their help in terms of the struggle against terrorism or whatever. So um, there are too many things, and that is why we have singled out some uh, parliamentarians and some businessmen and will not give him a passport or whatever. We have not done anything against Putin himself, nothing against the circle around him or whatever. So they are tiptoeing and uh, they are saying quite openly, you know, we, we cannot do a thing. Mm -hmm. So the uh, question, I guess, is where is Putin? Is he a left-wing nationalist right, or something right, like this? Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I mean, where is he? Clearly, he, he clearly is no friend of the quote unquote free market the way the NATO would want it or the way yeah. the EU would want it into right, the Ukraine. Right. But, uh, but the NATO is the big thing, you know yeah. what I mean, is to keep them away. I mean certainly he has free markets in Russia mm. with strong state regulation. Right. But it's NATO really yeah. that has been he's been trying to keep away from and we keep pushing it closer and closer to his borders. Yeah. And that was the red line that he drew. Right. But there's but there's still I mean it's I mean I I look at Putin and I still see this there's almost a construction of this sort of more uh, direct course of violence force, which is a much older version. And again, mm -hmm. the, you know, reading well, that's that. what they say. You know, they say we have the 20th century, uh, 21st century now, mm -hmm. and he operates with methods, you know, which belong in the 20th century. And, and yeah, so I don't know. He's how not doing anything that, that yeah. 
we wouldn't do, number one. Yeah. You know, number two, it's made it clear. I mean, I just got done reading a book by Stephen Cohen called Lost Alternatives, and what mm -hmm. that book made very clear is that the Cold War ended in 1991. The Russians mm -hmm. stopped fighting it, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. right, you yeah. know, we've continued right, to yeah. push and push and push, especially with the yeah. National Endowment for Democracy, which yeah. is the, uh, all these the NGO yeah, and right. whatnot. And, and yeah. he, Putin he just came out this week and said NGOs, Western NGOs, right. are going to start causing problems in Russia. Yeah. You know, just... Again, we'll say, okay, he's saying that because he wants to crack right. down on them and get them out, you know what I mean? But we know just American NGOs do yeah. those things. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? No, no, but, but even, even your phrasing right there is they're doing, you say, oh, they're doing nothing different than the United States does. Well, that's, that's fine, but we're proposing that the United States is this counter revolution neoliberalism. Their actions are engaged in this thing. Sure. So is, is Putin just doing similar tactics, and where, where do those of us? In the critical theory, where can we end up standing? I mean, this ends up being, you know, Putin, is, is Putin no worse than the United States in their actions and how they try yeah. to construct their yeah. surroundings? I mean, you talk about the Monroe yeah. Doctrine and this, you know, yeah. they desire to, I mean, but there's still this, 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 this force. I mean, what's the difference, really? Is what but I let's say, let's put it that from capitalism, you know, oligarchy, capitalism, and so So, all the relationship of state and society. I mean, he's an NKVD man, so he was educated as a socialist, you know, he grew up as such. And I think you know, lose that completely, so you may have some sympathies. But um, this the, the balancing act with us too is, you know, how much civil society and how much state intervention is necessary. You know, and the simple thing is, you know, that it decides itself in a certain way. So I mean, the businessmen here are, are angry, you know, because of state intervention. That's a very simple thing. Do it. Do what you're supposed to do. And that is insure people. Now, you had 200 years to insure people, and you didn't. So many millions were not insured at all, and the others had a damn insurance without hospitalization, without eye care, and so on and so on. That doesn't go, you know. So, but, so if, they, if they do fulfill the needs of people, you know, then you can keep the state out. That's the only way you can keep the state out. Now, if you don't do this, you know, for decades and decades and decades, you know, then you will call the state in. And I think in that sense, in, in the Slavic world, it is flu fluent too. What these oligarchs will do, you know, they, they came in, you know, the, with this counter-revolution victory, you know. These oligarchs came in, they exploited the territory, and many of them went back again and had the whole, uh, all the, the money which they made. You know, the states there were too weak to intervene, so they robbed and stole everything, into the universities even. The Western professors stole all the chairs in the university in Eastern Germany and so on and so on. So the, the, um, the people in the Kolchose in East Germany had hoped the capitalists would take it over, they would get better salaries and so on and so on. Well, the capitalists did come in from Denmark and Norway, bought the thing up, slaughtered all the cows and closed it up because they, they killed the opposition, the, the competition. That was it, you see. So, so the, the question, you know, them over there and we over here, we do have the same problem. What balance do we have between the state and civil society? And if civil society can really do things and fulfill the needs of the people, there is no need for the state to come in, you know, this policing force and so on. But if that doesn't happen, or in Russia, when these oligarchs become, you know, too hybris-like, too arrogant and so on, and get like here, you know, we have a guy who got three billion dollars a year. I mean, this is insanity, you know. Because these three billion dollars are missing over there on the other side where they sit in the slums and don't have anything. So uh, if something like that happens, then the states will intervene. And I think that Putin may not even have made up their mind, you know. I don't think that he would like to repress civil society as Stalin did. You know, he would say that wasn't a good thing, you know, we didn't really bloom economically and so on and so on. So he may, like the Chinese too, he may make some room for civil society. And the question is what these damned cocks of businessmen do with that. And if they function well, you know, I talked with two of them, I told you in the swimming pool and other places, and I said, you know, the only thing what you have to do is to fulfill these needs. We never thought of this. One said, if I had thought that we had something to do with needs, I would never have gone into business. I said, what the hell did you go into business for? I mean, there you have a real insane society, you know. One is a traveling guy, my son, you know. 
And I said, if people had no need to travel, you wouldn't have a job. <laughs> and also, we are three billion dollars. And I said, well, the owners of your shit place there would also not be owners if the people didn't want to uh, to travel, you know. And the same thing is obviously with drugs, you know. They have this unbelievable drugs thing here in this country. If you want to get rid of these drug laws, you just have to get rid of these needs. And if you don't get rid of those needs for drugs, you will never get rid of them. Even if you put one in prison, ten others will come up and will get into the business. So, but it's not, we are not used to start in civil society with the need system, in spite of the fact that this seems to be so unbelievably simple. You know, if it's the need for toilet paper or the need for food and so on. And it's not only that you deliver the food, but that the food is good and that you don't deliver cheap food, which makes people sick and fat in the slums, and so on. Now, all that is part of it. But, I mean, it, is, it doesn't need a quantum physics degree or whatever to see that if the private sector creates jobs, for instance, the state will have to, have to intervene. But if they don't create jobs, they create job creators, you know, or create them in the wrong place, then the state has to interfere because... 6.5% uh, uh, of unemployment is too high. So the capitalists need a reserve army which pushes on the wage system. But that is too high. That's too much for a reserve army. So a reserve army would include maybe 4.5% uh, unemployment or whatever, something like that probably. That would be a good thing. We would say that's a good thing if you have, you know, these are, nevertheless these are millions of people who are are not employed and are never employed, and so on. It's bad enough, you know. And then the state will have to come in with the food stamps and and unemployment compensation and, and whatever. So, so I mean, this if you want to know what Putin will do, I would predict that he will give continue. He will continue to give room for civil society. That means in civil society, when you let him go, you know that was the thing with Tito when we discussed that and split with him. Why not let these people, one million workers in Germany who made a lot of money there, take that money and open up a little, little restaurants and whatever? So you allow a low bourgeoisie. But Tito said no to this because if you have a low bourgeoisie, you know, some of them are beaten up, you know, and fall by, by the wayside, and the others become tycoons. So now what do you do with the tycoons? You know, do you guillotine them or what? Uh, if you want to prevent that, see that is the point. So, when he puts a tycoon into the into the thing there in the prison, then the West shouts, of course, you know, that he goes back to communism and whatever. But uh, it doesn't exactly mean that he goes back to communism. Uh, th these names, you know, they are not so important. What is important is to to regulate and to police it in such a way that at least the majority of people have their needs fulfilled. That means have enough to eat, enough clothing, enough housing, and not homeless running around there, and, uh, and that they have education, and that they have health care. And uh, you cannot keep people, you know, we are different from the animals, that we don't have just a set of four needs, but that we can differentiate needs. So you cannot simply keep people on an animal level. That's what they did in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the what is it called, the projects now? Mm -hmm in New York and everywhere, and in the tenement houses before. They kept the people on the level of the rats and the mice, it's run, you know. So that, uh, so that I think that is how it will be decided, and that may come up with a certain, uh, uh, you know, certain socialism in a certain form. Or another thing to say is how much personal autonomy will he allow? Uh, that includes also egoism or whatever. And uh, how will he balance it with, uh, in in terms of uh, solidarity, solidarity, you know? So it's uh, also the thing in the West just to make sure that he's never that Russia is never a superpower again. Well, I mean that's another thing. You you may not call it a superpower, but he may say, what does it mean? You know, this victory, neoconservative victory, was the greatest catastrophe. He will make efforts, you know, to bring all these people which have been split off, you know, according to the met method of Caesar, you know, divided emperor, divide them up and then dominate them, um, you know, to resist that. I, I think he will. Mm -hmm. That is in the name, you know, the Euro Eurasian Eurasian Union, you know, which which goes, you know, from Kiev to Vladivostok. That's where my, where the professors came from in the in the November when I was there in my course there. Um, you know, I, I signed a 
certificate there for a professor, a woman from like Vostok. I mean, that is in the Pacific, you know. And if they are not behaving right, these people there, he can easily turn, you know, to Lars Vostok, as I mean, it's the Chinese and can make common thing and then reaches deep into the Pacific, you know, which is more troublesome for us too. So I think, I mean, I think Obama is careful enough. I think this guy there, who is our... Um, John Kerry? The Kerry, uh, You know, Kerry was a Vietnam resistor. He became famous, you know, by going to Congress <coughs> and protesting and so on. But I'm, I never thought that he would be good at, at this whole thing. I think he does it in a very decent, uh, normal way, you know. But if you compare it with Kissinger, Kissinger was definitely better educated, you know, and had a better, better behavior too. So he, he is failing, of course, in with the Israelis, you know. But they are just a hopeless bunch of people, you know. So um, and he's traveling a lot back and forth and so on, but. I mean, it's a very difficult situation, but he's a very average man in a good sense, you know. But I wonder if that's enough, you know, in this uh, horribly complicated thing. I think he reacts, you know, wherever there is something burning, he goes there and tries to stamp out the fire or whatever. So, but, I mean, we can see it so far that there is a movement in the Slavic world and it has a popular basis and it will happen, you know, in the Central Asia states, and um, and they may, you know, not come back to a Soviet empire or so, but I think they will ally each other with each other economically and otherwise. And, and Europe, you know, is finished. I mean, historically, I mean, let's say finished, it's finished like Egypt was finished, and Greece was finished, and Rome was finished. That means it can sit there in the niche, but uh, it is not at the front any longer. And I don't think that China as such can move at the front, but Russia can. Why? It has something to do with the evolutionary potential, to what extent somebody has exhausted it. And I think the Europeans just have exhausted their evolutionary potential beyond recognition. And uh, so they can have a good life. and, and uh, the euro can function well and, and so on and so on, but that doesn't mean that one, uh, you know, is at the front of the of the human development. On the other hand, if they cannot cooperate or compete with each other, um, you know, adequately, and uh, it comes to some kind of a holocaust, they can pull the whole human species in the abyss. That is the uh, the great danger, you know, because both of them have uh, thousands of atomic heads and. Uh, and the Russian Federation is not concentrated anymore in Moscow, it's concentrated in all the capitals of all these 12. That means we cannot hit them at one strike, as we planned before. We have to hit 12 of them. And while we are doing that, they will hit Baltimore and Washington DC and then so on and so on, all over the place. It will be uh, just uh, nothing in comparison to the Second World War or whatever. So um, therefore, the, that they compete with each other who um, can reconcile this um, modern thing of personal autonomy, which we represent, you know, with all the decisions of homosexuality and so on. It's always one principle, principle of subjective freedom and so on, which, we, which is important, which we should keep, and which is very good. But on the other hand, we don't have solidarity. And you can, when, I mean, very concretely now, in a little nitty gritty things, you know, to deny or to resist uh, food stamps is a lack of solidarity. To um, decide you will not give five months more uh, unemployment compensation is a lack of solidarity. Uh, to not to give a minimum wage or to a certain level, that's a lack of solidarity. We lack solidarity all over the place. And so the more we can, or, or help here and so on, so the more we can catch up there in baby steps, you know, here is where on the local level and so on, where one can push things, you know, on the state level, on the local level, on the federal level, that these negatives in terms of lack of uh, uh, solidarity, that we, uh, um, that one does something about that. And every little step, you know, which can be forced, uh, and one shouldn't think so, you know, in so big things, but little things. And if, on the other hand, Putin and his people, you know, can grant more uh, personal um, uh, personal autonomy, which 
includes the tycoons. You know, if you give person autonomy, you allow them uh, in a certain sense and limit them at the same time. <laughs> that means make them into uh, little cows who give the milk, you know, and at the same time don't take over the store like they do here. Uh, that is the accomplishment. That is what has to be accomplished. That is the goal. And uh, the, the those uh, will be extraordinary, or what what do we call that, exceptionalism. Uh, that side will be most exceptional, which will reach that uh, reconciliation of these two opposite principles, which have never been together, by the way, in history. The old states were all solidarity, but they had no autonomy, you know. So um, backwardness, when you talk about backwardness of the Russians, you know, it has something to do with that lack of, uh, of uh, personal autonomy. So I think that would be our theoretical, critical theory approach to the whole thing. And, and it goes down to, you know, what one can do or talk about um, daily, you know, in these, uh, in these struggles there, where the Roosevelt people, also well the liberals, you know, are ahead of the others who are somehow saurious or ichthyosaurious or whatever, they were back in the 19th century or whatever this is. And the Republican Party is just in the hall of shape and the question is how they get themselves together is very important. I mean, they lose the battle all the time, every day, and I am of course happy that they lose, lose it, you know. But um, it would be much better if one could have a bigger majority in order to get those progressive steps forward. And, uh, you know, there's nothing at the moment. They're just blocking the whole thing all the time without any alternatives. So they get crazy over there. I mean, I read yesterday, you know, where he said something about the French Revolution and the terrorism, and, and he said a lot of people became insane at that time. It is, uh, you know, insanity, this, this position that you have there with this radio guy there and, and uh, the Fox News there. I mean, this, this is out of the range of normality. <coughs> okay, so that was our contemporary issue today. Um, I think we have to turn the light on somehow. Can we turn the light on? So we looked at this here, our, uh, our book there, from book. That is another little baby step in the right direction, I hope. Um, do we have any other? Uh, on side. No, 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 it's on the, it's where the works found. Yes, leave that on there. That, that was right, there. leave that on. No, where it's round, there's the round thing? Yeah, right, okay, wonderful. Okay, so that was the, I'll um, just uh, uh, look at this, some things which we can, uh, there was again a school stabbing yesterday in Pittsburgh and so on. So every week I say two weeks from now there will be another mass murder or whatever and this time it was not even two weeks, it was only one week. And so there are 24 people who were stabbed by one guy with two knives and so on. So you don't even need any more a gun or whatever. So it's not a question of gun control anymore. <laughs> but it's a psychological problem. And then you have uh, in From, you have his essay on a question, then you have a whole book on the structure of human aggressiveness, which would be very helpful. And you can go from from, of course, into Freud and the death drive and, and so on. So, uh, so one could start the analysis with the human organism, what is in terms of our, you know, A there, uh, uh, old map. Um, so what is that in us? Is there a killer instinct in us? But however one decides that, then there is another level, you know, of marriage and fa family and children's education and including play and sport and so on and um, what is why, it, why that does not work in order to sublimate this aggression enough so that it breaks through all the time. So, so one thing, I mean Freud was very biologically deterministic by saying well we have that killer instinct and no matter what you do in society you will always murder in, in one way or the other. If you have gun control laws, then they take knives, you know. If you don't have knives, they take gun, but they will take something or take a stick or whatever, a football, bang the other to, to death and so on. So, but um, even when that is the case, and Freud would th think that this was the case, and Schopenhauer would think that it was the case, so that we are murderous. I was 
species, but then the question is of civilization and <laughs> the family education, and there comes the whole thing of our coming from and authority and the family and so on. Uh, what is wrong with our family? Is there enough authority to deal with the aggressiveness which comes up with the little baby already? You know, the little baby ah, shouts and you cannot get milk enough or whatever, you know, or beats his brother up, you know, and kills him and so on. So, um, so that that has to be, if it is the constant of our chimpanzee nature, then there is still the question, why can our civilization not deal with that, including religion? <coughs> because religion, by Freud and others, they thought it had to deal with this aggression. It would make us less aggressive. But then you have the religious wars, of course, and, uh, you know, the other Akbar, or whatever, recently somebody, I think it was in Afghanistan, there were somebody slaughtered some people in Allah Akbar again and so on. So it is so it's a, it's a civilization problem. The critical theorists saw it as a civilization problem. What do we do with our animal base, you know, which libidinous side is one thing and, and so on. And we have of course religious answers. We have the Gautama and uh, no uh, you know, the 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 only thing what the monks did when, when the fascists DM and we put them there they burned themselves down, so they are directed the aggressive tribe against themselves rather against others. And, and uh, so, uh, but this is the line of argumentation. So we would have to start with biology. Um, why that happens all the time, but it is not a sufficient answer because not all societies have this killing every two weeks. It's not there in Sweden. It's not there in Norway. It's not there in Denmark, and so on. Uh, but you have a horrible outbreak like it was in Germany, you know, where suddenly they, they kill uh, all the minorities there and then kill 27 million people in Russia and so on. So it can break through suddenly horribly, but with us it breaks through now, you know, predictably, I can already predict now that two weeks from now we will have another mass murder in, in, a, in a, somehow in a movie theater or in a school or uh, this time it was in a school again or in a, in a bag or whatever. So. We had just one week ago, the president was just there talking about this uh, this murder thing, mass <coughs> murder thing going on in uh, in Fort Hood again. So, um, and if we, so one thing that we do here at home, in order to deal with that killer instinct, then when we go and make a war, we train people, of course, to apply it. That means suddenly they can do it in another country, but they are not allowed to do it home. So then they kill two million Iraqis or two million Asians in Vietnam and so on. So, but then when we bring them home, we want to turn that off again. So we first of all, and our our behaviorists here, you know, do a tremendous job in the Vietnam War. You could condition a, a, a peaceful uh, a guy there, an office guy, into an aggressive marine who killed all day long. So, but then there's the question when you bring them back and. When this guy came back from Vietnam, as many committed suicide here at home as had fallen in battle. And we have the same thing now, now the numbers of suicides are many. So the same instinct is at work, killing others, and it can turn against one's own ego. Right. So, uh, yes. When I was in the VA hospital this last week with my dad, they said that on average 22 Vietnam vets kill themselves a day. Yeah. Right. A day. Right. Today. It is the same same thing, you know, which we had in Vietnam, you know. Yeah, fifty six thousand or so killed themselves. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, these are Vietnam vets, twenty two Vietnam vets. Oh the Vietnam still, yeah, right. Today oh, are killing still, themselves. Yeah, yeah. Suicide, yeah. But there are the others now from Afghanistan and Iraq uh, added to it. And there's some new thing because of the weapon technology has changed these road uh, road bombs. They uh, they either kill somebody and kill, take the head off or whatever. But those who are not killed uh, get a shock in the nervous system or brain damage and so on. So, uh, so, it's no, so but these things, you know, should uh, the press, you know, is just uh, mass media, are just in a hopeless situation. They they have to normalize as fast as possible. But as soon as they are normalized, two weeks later, the whole damn thing happens again, and then they say the same thing again. But it was psychologically unstable, and and, uh, and then. We have to have more money in order to have, have uh, you know, this uh, health insurance for for mentally ill people and so on. So, okay. So, nevertheless, we have to take that seriously. And I think from more than Harmas or uh, uh, Hamid and so on may have still something to say about it. If he is radical enough, you know, maybe from maybe from.
Freud um, was right with this. It is so unbelievably uncomfortable to accept Freud, you know, to, that we have that killer instinct in us. And I don't feel like killing anybody and so on. But it depends, you know, what situation you are in and what the stimuli are. Mm -hmm. So that something which is unconscious breaks through. And then you say later on, this guy who stabbed all these people yesterday morning or this morning, you will say, you know, I didn't know myself anymore, or I didn't know who I was, or whatever, you know. Or my the right side of my brain didn't function. Or they want to they want to treat him as an adult there in the court now, but some people will say, well, his brain was not developed yet, right, or whatever. So, <laughs> but we we have to, you know, that would be one direction of uh, exploration and so on. So that was in Pittsburgh, in a good area, by the way. Um, we said something about that almost jokey thing, and they forgot about it. In the meantime, the Iranians set up an, an ambassador who was the leader of the people who took our uh, people p p uh, prisoner there uh, during the revolution and, and held them prison there for so many days. And then uh, Carter tried to get him out. Uh, he did that thing which failed in the desert there. Somehow God was not on Carter's side. And, um, but uh, then... Um, Reagan made a deal with them that they kept him even longer uh, so that Carter would not have the triumph to have him brought home which would have brought Carter into office again So, and then you know the, the money which came from that uh, the, uh, Reagan used then to pay the contrast which yeah. the, the Congress had forbidden and so on, which is an <coughs> impeachable crime and nobody ever took it up uh, the miserable actor there I think it was 440 days or 44 days. Right, yeah, yeah. But so the guy who was the leader of this whole keeping American business is now the ambassador at the UN, and you have to give him a visa. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, and, and the right would say, this is another case how Obama, how weak he is, he projects weakness. <laughs> That's why all that happens to us, you know. Okay. <laughs> then Obamacare, you know, is now, uh, they have 7 million people that have registered for it. It is, by the way, up to, I think, 10, nine, seven, 10 million, I think, in the meantime. Today, some corporation uh, made another uh, study there. So, And that drives, of course, the, uh, the other neoliberals, you know, uh, mad there. And that's, that's why they say those things. By the way, they took our movie there, the Hitler movie, where Hitler talks there, you know, to his people, and they put another text on it, yeah, you know, yeah. about lying. Yeah, and so on. Off what what a tasteless type of a thing that is. It's so hard to see the connection with it all between what Hitler says and what they put uh, him right. saying there. So, so I mean, this is really madness there. So, <laughs> by the way, another thing they don't hang together really, the Germans, um, have now a 63 years retirement thing. <coughs> you have to retire when you're 63. Um, I'm, I'm, I will also have a early retirement, I think. <laughs> right. Now, that is, you know, it's something, this woman there, what is her, uh, the German <laughs> chancellor there? Um, Angela Merkel. Um, Angela Mer Merkel, yeah. Merkel. So, she is right wing, you know. She is the uh, chancellor of the Christian Democratic Party. So in Germany, she is really far on the right. If she would be here, she would be left of Obama, you know. <laughs> there you can see how far to the right we are. And everything what we said today or whatever we say, we have to see that this text which we speak is in this context. We are one of the most right wing countries existing. And therefore, you know, when they say, the Russians say, you know, you support Nazis there, and uh, Obama was so upset about this, you know, how can they say this? We have nothing to do with it. We fought against them. Together with them, we fought against them and so and so. But there is a little bit of truth in, in all of this, uh, too. So, but it was a Marxist idea, you know, to, to come to alternative future number three by lowering the, the work hours, working hours. So to get the working hours down to eight hours was already a success. And then one could get it even down further and then one could produce that realm of freedom on the realm of necessity so the realm of necessity is the work time 
and uh, economic and biological and so on, and that will be pushed back in terms of the working hours. So if you work then six hours, uh, then you can use the West for the realm of freedom. In the kibbutzim, that would do, do photography, you do gymnastics, you, know, you paint, uh, you play music, and, and so on and so on. And I saw how that works there in, uh, in the kibbutz in, in Israel. Uh, they, uh, you know, they have factories of some kind, the kibbutz is a glass factory. They can produce, you know, 10,000 windows, and they say, we produce only 5,000 windows because we want to take the rest of the time for dancing, for, you know, doing religious stuff, and, and they were all sexual, but they still did religious stuff. And uh, so that is when what is in man, not nature, but what is in him, freedom and spirit, where that can be cultivated. So that was the idea. So, <coughs> and uh, that is one expression of this, there was 63 hours. And it has another meaning too, when you have unemployment, then you get that down, you get the unemployment down too. Okay, because the retired are not considered to be unemployed, in spite of the fact that they are, that they are unemployed. Um, so Kabul, there was um, uh, the, the bombs again, uh, there to prevent the thing, but it went, they, they had their election, did they? Did it, has it come through? Has it been counted already? Kabul? Kabul, yeah. Uh, yeah, they had the election. Who won? They, they don't have the results. The results are yeah. oh, like yeah. in the middle yeah. of May or something like that. Right, okay, right. Yeah. There is still this NSA there, spying thing is still hanging, and uh, that's where the right also makes makes Obama a fascist and all this. So, um, Japan does not want to kill whales for the rest of 2014. There is this, there's these anti-whale boats there around to do a good job. Hmm? Sea Shepherd. Yeah, Sea Shepherd, yeah, right. right. So at least this year they have <coughs> enough uh, whales to eat there. So. Um, okay, so uh, there, you know, the question was um, if this genocide thing has ended with Hitler and so on, but um, there is an anniversary of Rwanda there, I think it's 20 years now, where I think 800,000 people were killed by the Tutsis, right? Tutsis, uh, the Hutus killed the Tutsis, right? That's, I always mix them up. That is the Hutus killing the Tutsis, yeah. And uh, they have made some progress there. They had, um, like in South Africa, they had some courts where people confessed their crimes and then they were forgiven. And uh, so they are living together peacefully. So that is a good thing. Okay, then. Uh, what is in the foreground also is equal pay for women there that is on our campus too they paid the women something but the women are not happy with the payments it uh, had the opposite effect so that is another that was defeated problem. today wasn't it was it defeated in the congress yes mm. oh ok I thought yeah. he signed it as an executive order come again I thought Obama signed it as an executive order no it was in congress too right oh. yeah so I looked yeah, on right. MSNBC yeah. today but you hear what the what the Republicans said to him though. They looked at all the staffers and whatnot in, in the White House and yeah. said, "But even you pay the people yeah. in the White House, the women, eighty percent to the eighty cents right. to the dollar of the men." Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In the White House. <coughs> well, well, the system's in place. Right. 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 Well, you yeah. want us to do that? You start first. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> any other uh, addition to to the contemporary issues? If not, then we can go on. There. The last time we tried to go into the deep structure a little bit of the uh, of the critical theory. Um, so, the opposite of what the positivists do for once, not to stay on the surface, but to and we did that by saying, you know, that um, Horkheimer thinks that what the German idealist and the Jews have in common is that uh, form firm sense for reality, to be realistic, including also reality politics, realpolitik, and all this. Uh, and on the but on the other hand, not to uh, give up the idea. And so so uh, that's that sounds a little bit mysterious there with this idea. And we wanted to make that clear. We have, of course, in Plato, we have that with Aristotle, Thomas 
realism that's Kant. Objective idealism, the universal is in the thing that is uh, Schelling and Triste and so on, and Hegel, but Hegel also adds then the um, absolute idealism. That means he thinks he can know what the idea is. Uh, against Kant, who said we cannot penetrate the idea with our analytical understanding, uh, we uh, the same thing like Moses. And the critical theorist put Moses and the, the second sentence. This commandment, together with um, uh, Kant's prohibition of analytic understanding, penetrated the thing in itself. Now, we have the discovery of the dialectics of enlightenment. This, of course, comes from Hegel, so the, the Horkheimer and Adorno didn't discover it. It was discovered 100 years earlier. That means the enlightenment um, moved over into, uh, into positivism. It according to Hegel, it degenerated into positivism. But um, what Hegel was so horribly upset in his philosophy of religion was that the enlightenment, the third estate, shopkeepers, carpenters, and so on, that they uh, promoted that prejudice that one could not know the idea or the absolute or God, that one could not know them, and it became a generally accepted uh, thing and here we have to see, you know, if we have not to be critical, also of the critical theorist as well, because if we think of Fromm's X experience, X means that the idea cannot really be known. It is, but we cannot make any images of it, and we cannot name it. So, um, and and the same thing is true. The longing for the totally other, that totally other has not or is not supposed to have any content. Now, like the Jews, you know, they were not, uh, Hockheimer were not, Hockheimer was not always uh, faithful to his uh, thing. So they sometimes, Adorno too, called uh, totally other perfect justice, or they called it unconditional love. Now, when you say that, then suddenly the idea gets a content again. But that was against their own teaching, uh, in a certain sense. They were inconsistent in a certain way. Also, when they say that the idea is the same thing like that the murderer shall ultimately not triumph over the innocent victim, that there will be perfect justice, that these victims will have their day in court, or like the Christians who know that Jesus, the poor man, was murdered by the witch, but that was not the last word. That means the murderers, the witch and the powerful, did not have the last word because he was resurrected by Yahweh, by his father. And uh, that is behind this idea there, that the murderer shall not triumph over the innocent victim, uh, uh, at least not ultimately. So Bush and his cabinet, the murderers, uh, do obviously now survive, uh, and no, nobody, the nation doesn't have the courage to put them on trial or to send them to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Den Haag. And they are not leaving the country because every UN state has the obligation to put them in the, in the court and to, uh, to charge them. So they just stay at home, and uh, we don't do anything about it. We, we, all these people, businessmen who were responsible for 2008 catastrophe, they were put on trial in London, in Berlin, and so on everywhere, but not here. And so, on. so, so uh, that. Uh, um, uh, is so th th there, in a certain sense, the Hegel and Horkheimer, that what I will talk about in Rome there. Um, now, for Hegel, the idea is the result of his whole logic. It begins with being through essence to notion and to the idea. So the idea is filled, it is determinate, it is knowable, and that has a background, namely Master Eckhart. You know, who had the same thing, and it is called um, panentheism. Panentheism, or panentheism, also be the identity of the identical and the non-identical. So it is the identity of the identical with the big, uh, large I that would be the God, that is the absolute, and the non-identical that is the nature, and that is man. Now, uh, the when you are a pantheist then the divine and nature are identical. But panentheism is different. So the monks of the Holy Inquisition, when they condemned Eckhart, mixed up pantheism and panentheism. And in another book that I suggested written in the Pope there, that they should uh, open up the, uh, the trial against Eckhart again, because uh, when he was still alive, they tried him and they 
found him innocent, but after he was dead and couldn't defend himself anymore, then they sentenced him again. And so for 700 years now, he is, uh, is excommunicated. So uh, because the monks, you know, couldn't grasp it. So the issue between pantheism, which would not be reconcilable with Christianity, in spite of the fact that Christianity is closer to pantheism than it's to bourgeois theism in this country. But it is not pantheism. Deus, Stephen, Natura, God and nature are not the same thing. That's Spinozism. And it may also be Marxism, you know, because we only know the sociologist Marx, what he says about religion. And we know only what he says about false religion, and the bourgeois religion, opium religion. He never attacked Jesus himself. He attacks the Christians because they betray Jesus. Nietzsche attacked Jesus himself because of his slave, slave morality. He was the last bourgeois enlightener, but not Marx. So, and uh, that is as horrible what, what the bourgeois professors and so on have done to Marx by, by turning that on and says, this is a bad guy because he says religion is opium. But he says, you religion is opium, and your opium religion, and that comes from Kant and from, from Hegel, your opium religion means you make people feel good and you dull their conscience so that they can then, with a good conscience, kill one million people in Iraq and leave all their people down in the slums, and they have a good conscience at the same time. The Lord gives them their wealth, and the other one have to live in poverty. This whole horrible, horrible thing in this country. So um, with that, uh, uh, so this is continued, it's completely turned upside down. So, <laughs> nevertheless, the... Um, the, so the, it was Eckhart, and it's not only Eckhart, it's also Jakob Böhme. So the, the critical theory, like we said it before with the monks and three of us, they have a tremendous depth dimension, which one has to understand if one wants to know why that's going on, you know. How can it be that an order, like the Benedictine order, starts in the 6th century and is around in the godforsaken Michigan in um, April 2014, you know. This is enormous. I mean, they don't procreate, you know. It's not that they have uh, children and grandchildren or whatever. It always has to be newly reinstituted. That means people always have to get the spirit and the rule again and must like it and follow it and so on. So it's an enormous time. Like the survival of the Jews is an enormous thing. But people who have no, no state who could enforce the law, they hold on the, to the law for 2,000 years, in spite of the fact that it's not enforced by any state. <coughs> so these are, uh, you know, quite little. So, so nevertheless, so, and not only that, it's not only Jacob Böhme, <coughs> Master Eckhart, it is also Sholem, that is the Kabbalah, um, and uh, what do the Kabbalah thinks about the idea. So the idea for the Kabbalah, for the Christian, the Protestant, and Catholic, and so mystics, has a content but it has no content for the enlightenment anymore. So that is why Hegel's philosophy cannot make common cause with civil society, as he says at the end of the philosophy of religion, or with the enlightenment or with civil society, and that the philosopher uh, are a priesthood which is separate <coughs> from those enlighteners who move on the level of analytical understanding and reflection and can only deal with finite things and cannot know anything about the infinite anymore. And Nietzsche made fun about that. He said, you know, Kant proved with uh, all kinds of tricks there what everybody knew already, that namely that nobody can know the absolute and so on. So here there is an abyss. So it is true that <coughs> somehow idealism, including Hegel and Judaism, are identical and uh, that the critical theory are based in that. But if uh, Horkheimer prays Psalm 91 and puts the first one on his verse on his parents' grave and the second one in his grave, this internal one still has a content. It is the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he gets angry and he loves and he acts in history and he moves the Egyptians against the Jews, and the Babylonians against the Jews, the Egyptians against the Babylonians, the Persians against the Babylonians, and so on. So he is very un unlike the God of Deism here, the bourgeois religion here, civil religion, where the God has gone, and the world is atheistic, and they can do with it whatever they want to, colonialism and everything. And uh, God is wordless, a cosmism, he has no world whatsoever, he's just God. So, um, so that is uh, important now to see how, for instance, if that absolute has no uh, no content, how 
one can deduct from it any kind of an ethics or social ethics. And so, the, in, in reality, um, Horkheimer still holds on to a theological ethics, uh, in spite of the fact that he is very close to Kant and so on. But Habermas is more honest in this whole thing and says, let's give up, you know, that, uh, let's have that to totally de -anthropo anthropomized. Demythologized absolute, and he got very angry, Habermas, when, when the student suddenly, you know, reified the absolute in any form whatsoever. But then you have to find another uh, basis for your ethics, and that is then an anthropological basis, namely language and memory and recognition, and uh, which we have with Hanneth and Marx and Apple, and so on. So that's basically so. And nevertheless, that was what, what I want to mention once more there. Uh, and there is another word which comes up here, that is dehellenization, right? Which has something to do with that. So we saw that Plato uh, had a universal before the thing, Aristotle a universal in the thing, and then comes nominalism before the Reformation. That means we cannot know the nature of things anymore. We just have names in ourselves for these things, and these names are, are uh, arbitrary. That means we label them. We label that to be a tree, and label that to be a lamp, or whatever. So this nominalism. Now, that is a departure, then, from, uh, from Plato and Aristotle, and this is called dehellenization. So already the Reformation was dehellenized. Luther was a nominalist. Gabriel Beale was his teacher. He had no contact anymore with the Aristotelianism of uh, Thomas Aquinas or Albertus Marcus in Paris and so on. So the Reformation is dehellenized, and from there also the bourgeois revolution was dehellenized, and that is why Hegel had that criticism that they, uh, they emptied that absolute, and that was also true for the uh, for the Enlightenment theologians and the uh, philosophers and so on. That is why Karl Barth thought that Hegel was the last great theologian, and that from then on the, the, the theologians lost it. So, by the exegesis and by the higher criticism and so on, they got mixed up in details, and they lost that the New Testament uh, or the Torah or the Holy Quran um, say something about the absolute. The, the absolute is concrete; it is determined. It's not empty. It's not abstract. Okay, so, and then today, you know, our, our multiculturalists and so on are also, of course, de-Hellenized. And Ratzinger was this unhappy person, you know, who fought that. And they had a, they had a discussion with Habermas about this de-Hellenization. And uh, uh, um, the, the Pope there emphasized, you know, the loss which that means not to have any kind of objective universal anymore and um, and uh, the uh, Habermas emphasized the tremendous advantage of this um, the great natural science revolution would not have happened without that uh, turn to nominalism and uh, the French revolution would not have happened without that and, and uh, the, the, uh, the international law development and so on and so on so that was the controversy between the two, and the attempt of Ratzinger to go back or uh, undo the dehellenization obviously failed. And uh, that, uh, by the way, last week there was something where I made a, gave an interview to somebody, and my daughter sent me the article, and I didn't give any interview. Now this is very ghostly. Now I'm giving interviews <laughs> without giving them. This goes automatic now. Which is uh, nice as long as they will really say what I want to say. Okay, so. Um, that wasn't the Washington Post one, was it? I don't know where she found it. She sent it to the whole family. I didn't see it. I didn't look. It, uh, they may have taken some other interview which I gave before and just warmed it up again. I don't know what. So, okay, so, but one thing as far as the title of our course is concerned, we talked about this pathology, right? So, uh, is it so that reason and freedom become pathological because of the loss of transcendence or so? So, what we have in the West is we had an ID 
see here of Anaxagoras that reason governs the world. And that was the reason with the big R, and that providence governs the world and so on. That got lost somehow. So uh, the idea is not reason any longer. We cannot say that. So then we have only human reason. And that human reason can still maybe discover some rationality in nature. As a matter of fact, Karl-Heinz Haag, a student of, uh, of uh, um, Haagheimer, whom I visited very often, he wrote a book until just recently in 2004 or 5 or whatever, where he emphasized that, that there is no rational natural science without uh, presupposing a somewhat rational uh, nature which, which it studies. So, but I don't know if everybody accepts it. So, uh, so but, but what is left then is only the subjective reason, and uh, that means the Kantian idealism could still be there, and the positivists sometimes have some similarity to that subjective idealism. So, we are left alone with our own subjective rationality, and that means our civilization here in the States is extremely subjective in all its, uh, its I mean, the culture wars that comes up continually, the subjectivism, let's see, you know, the woman can uh, have this free autonomy, this personal autonomy over her body and so on and so on, and uh, the same thing uh, with the homosexuals, you know, they have their own choice, what they want to choose, so it's not an objective measure of some kind, what the nature of man is or whatever, or the nature of the family is, the nature of society, but the emphasis is on personal autonomy. That is our principle. We said that before, and the principle which is missing is the uh, solidarity thing on the other side. So we have moved in an extreme direction by emphasizing civil society so much more than the state, and by emphasizing also per, uh, the uh, uh, personal autonomy much more than, uh, than, than solidarity in its different forms. Solidarity with the past, the present, and the future. Okay, so uh, if that is it, you know, does the pathology of human reason have something to do that reason has no counterpart? That means that we are, that between our reason and the real world out there, that means the real family, uh, the real civil society, and so on, that there are abstractions moving in between them, which makes it impossible for our reason to get in contact with whatever reason, objective reason, is present there. Uh, so uh, a woman on, online, she said something about, she talked a bunch about, about pornography, and so on, and she, it's an ethics class, so... Uh, pornography is ethical, and she divided up, you know, private pornography and then the social type of pornography, and uh, maybe the private one is okay, the other one is not okay, and so. So I try to make clear, you know, uh, what um, according to modern non-theological ethics, you know, what one could say about pornography and how one could say if it is good or bad, if it should be assisted or should be allowed, and, and so on. So um, and so I, I use the uh, you know, the Apple thing and the Habermas thing, the, the discourse ethics, where the principle of generalization is the basis. So because what is missing is I did what I thought was right, but we know that this is not a very sensical sentence because Hitler did, of course, what he thought was right. And he regretted deeply that he hadn't killed all the Jews, and, but he had uh, killed enough, and that made him happy to the last day of his life. And so, and so uh, to say I did what, what was right is, you know, in terms of the principle of subjective uh, autonomy, uh, it is right, you know, because I thought so. But this has whatever I have there, my axiom has to be universalized in order to gain objectivity. So. You have that already in the first attempt to have a non-theological ethics Kant, a categorical imperative, act in such a way that your particular axiom can be the basis of a universal legislation. If that cannot be done, then uh, it, it cannot be ethical. So, and from this Kantian position comes then the a priori of the unlimited communication community of Habermas and so on. So, um, I said to, to, to the girl there, so, let's try that if that gives us an answer to pornography. So that means we 
we have to get a consensus uh, of a fictitious in a certain sense. The unlimited communication community never comes together, but we think in those terms of the unlimited communication community. And um, so, you know, the Reagan thing to make a shield uh, and, and so on. If 100 million people in the East or West want to sacrifice their lives so that 200 million Americans can live, if the particularly potential victims, we get their consensus, then it could be done and it would be ethical. Uh, or uh, in terms of abortion, uh, is it ethical or not? Uh, not uh, taking the natural law position or, or the Old Testament or new one or whatever, or you should not kill or whatever, but by saying, you know, can we get the consensus of the victims? The victims are one and a half million abortions a year, so now they cannot talk. But we could have an advocate, and the advocate would say, you know, what kind of irrational behavior is that you put a, a little embryo into existence, and then three months later you annihilate it again. Uh, it's not a very sensible thing, it's a nihilistic type of uh, procedure. So, But one could also say, you know, the advocate could say to little embryos in slums, uh, you know, it's much better not to be born instead of than living 40 or 50 or 60 years in the Kalamazoo slum. That is a horrible, horrible, hellish thing to think about. So then abortion would be a good thing if the advocate would argue the way. Now, how about porno now, you know? <laughs> Who are the victims of, of the porno business? Um, well, and, and can, can we get the consensus of the victims? The victims are, for instance, the porno queens. When they are 25 or so, they are nuts and are m mentally damaged and so on. So, but uh, what if they are damaged and they don't care about being damaged? Because they made a lot of money and uh, it was fun after all. So, um, well, then it could, could be acceptable. Are there other victims, you know, are people getting hooked by the whole thing and like, like with, uh, with uh, alcohol or whatever and cannot stop it anymore and so on. So um, that would be kind of uh, victims. Or the abstractions which take place because porno abstracts from marriage, it abstracts from the love of the partner, there's no trace of it. It abstracts from the fertilization process which it uh, pretends, but which is not there. Um, it abstracts from children and so on. So it is a complete abstraction, and these abstractions can uh, mislead people, of course. That means they can think that these abstractions are the biological truth of the whole thing, which is not, or the psychological truth, or the marital truth, or whatever. So, and then uh, being misguided can make... Uh, uh, the wrong decisions and live a completely unsuccessful life. So they would be the victims and if we could not get the vi uh, consensus of the victims then porno would be bad. If we can get the, the consensus of the victims it would be alright and it could be supported and so on and so on. So, uh, so that, uh, but <laughs> that is an example, you know, here for where the reason uh, is caught up in abstractions and cannot penetrate the universal in the thing itself or with Plato above things and um, and this may be the reason for for the uh, pathology and then of course the therapy we have in our title too would be there can one gain <laughs> uh, that again, you know, can one remove these um, these abstractions so that one has a concrete picture of what the family is, what marriage is, what the society is, what the state is, what history is, and so on. Um, and how is that to be done? How can this connection be made again? So th th to make the connection again would be therapeutic. To not to get the connection means that the insanity continues and, and goes deeper and deeper. <laughs> so the, the um, it's interesting that you know Hegel had a strange attitude to, to the French Revolution. Some of that he he liked, Saïwa, uh, for instance, of the Marseillaise or so, was something very fascinating that you have masses of people of the Third Estate marching to to Versailles, Versailles, and then greeting the king and so. On. So it was a real liberation uh, experience, you know. But on the other hand, the, that the whole revolution moved only on the level of analytical understanding, analytic reflection, and uh, therefore, for instance, emphasized the principle of equality, which we still do, but completely abstract.
abstractly, namely that equality also contains difference. And if you have equality without any difference, then you will cut heads off. Every head which is too big or too high will have to be cut off. And it is that what leads to terror, and it's this terror which leads to insanity. So the the question is here, you know, to between this uh, type of uh, understanding, which uh, has uh, the idea of uh, freedom, 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 and so on, or uh, without any difference, or equality, equality without any difference, uh, so that one keeps two opposite uh, and one and unites them then that leads to, to terror actions, and that then also uh, terror actions themselves, so independently leads to insanity as well. So the question of therapy would be how to move from analytical understanding to uh, more dialectical thinking. Um, so also, let me just turn it another way. So if one thinks of a revolution you know, as the negation of the old system, um, like um, when Kuchar, for instance, went to the UN and said, we will bury you or so. That was an abstract negation. And this abstract negation would mean, you know, capitalism is completely disappearing and all what they did was evil and so on. Um, uh, that would lead to counter-revolutions and to failure and so on. So a concrete thing would be, yes, capitalism has to be negated, but it had its good sides. And you see in the in the uh, Communist Manifesto that there is a whole chapter on the tremendous accomplishments, you know, of analytical understanding of the natural sciences of the bourgeoisie, and so they have done things, you know, which are enormous. If you think of that house, if you think electricity of the airplanes, uh, the airplanes get lost and so on. But uh, you know, overall, some of them stay up there. So that's an amazing type of an accomplishment. And so, therefore, Marx and Engels did not negate the bourgeoisie abstractly. I mean, they got all the education from the bourgeoisie. Uh, so, but rather concretely, that means something new is created, and that new will be united with things which are reserved. So the critical theory has a double attitude. Under fascism, it will be revolutionary. Under liberalism, it will rather strengthen what has to be preserved, what should not get lost. And for them, that was for the German language. They went on talking German here instead of talking English and so on. So, um, or the great Western civilization, which they thought was threatened. <laughs> the reason why Benjamin did not go to Jerusalem but stayed in Frankfurt and so on was that they all shared this idea that they had a mission. And the mission was to rescue the Western civilization by going to its roots in Jerusalem and in Athens and in, in Rome and, and so on. So particularly in Jerusalem. So, mm -hmm. um, so with that, you know, uh, we can catch up a little bit with what was our theme here before, uh, namely what that means, this pathology. And uh, then comes the praxis, you know, what one can do. And uh, we could then talk with uh, Hanef then uh, about the politics of redistribution and the politics of recognition. Um, and we said that we have it here there. American sociologist, a woman, and she worked together, and she emphasized particularly the redistribution of wealth, and then he, the uh, politics of, uh, of uh, recognition, and so on. So that means, how do they want to heal um, the pathology? Not by going back to God or to any, any religion or so, but by going to something which is, of course, not absolute, but relative, namely language, uh, language and memory, and uh, the struggle of recognition. So Habermas had already both, but he emphasized language, and Hannes emphasized recognition to the extreme, and so on. So what does that look like in detail? So if we have um, women, that we have this today, they mentioned that a little bit, women not equally paid or so. Um, so on one side, it looks like their distribution of wealth uh, seems to be a financial thing. They have to get as much money as men. So now they get 80% of what men get or 70% or whatever. And it seems to be in all professions the same way. So, um, But is it not also, first of all, <laughs> so Hannes would say, you know, a problem of a status group. That means 
that they get less, not because they work less or whatever, but because they have less of a validity, they have less of a recognition that a man uh, is recognized as a general or a CEO or whatever, um, that somehow there is a prejudice involved, of course, you know, the prejudice that women are weaker, that women cannot fight so well, that they cannot count so well, that they are emotional, that every four weeks they lose it, and so on and so on. So that, uh, uh, that is then a status quo. And how would one approach this and bring rationality in this situation would be, first of all, to um, uh, give to women the same validity, to get rid of the patriarchal prejudices against them, um, uh, and that would be hard work, for instance, and um, and this patriarchal prejudice, is, for instance, in Islam, you know, we discussed that with the Imam. There are no women Im- uh, Imams, you know, so Roman Catholicism, there are no women priests. You see that in these religious groups, obviously, uh, these prejudices against women are stronger than they are in Protestantism, where we have women, uh, and, and even in uh, Judaism, you know, where you have female rabbis now, and, and so on. So, um, I think in these religions as well, it is a struggle for recognition. And um, I wish I could take my people still to that wonderful <laughs> heroic woman here, the Anglican priest. She fought, first of all, you know, for that she could become a priest. That was hard enough. And then she found out that she was a lesbian, and she has a uh, partner on our campus, and uh, she fought for both of that in this uh, in Kalamazoo here, which is quite hard. And she um, had that cathedral. When you go to the airport on the left side, uh, she was ahead of this cathedral. And it was the bishop's seat too, and so lesbians and homosexuals came, but they were not enough, and they could pay for the cathedral, so they sell, sold it to a sect, which now uh, build another temple right beside it and uses the other one as a museum or whatever. Like a tin can, that could hmm? be like a giant tin can. Yeah, right, thing. yeah. So it's, it's, but, uh, so you have that, she fought that struggle for recognition, but it was also connected with money somehow too, you know, but first thing to be recognized as a woman, that also a woman can be a priest and to be recognized as a lesbian, that also a lesbian can be a priest. There's nothing wrong with being lesbian, so to, to clean out all these homophobic uh, type of prejudices which people have. So so when we go down, you know, how the struggle is fought concretely and how the therapy is practiced. The way of therapy is these two ways to go, a distribution of wealth, and redistribute uh, and uh, uh, st- uh, politics of recognition, and sometimes both of them have to be uh, uh, combined. <laughs> so in many cases, you know, homosexuals are not poor people. You find which lawyers, which doctors. So there is no question of redistribution of wealth. You have a pure uh, uh, thing of struggle for recognition that they um, should be recognized, you know, in their gender choice, in their sexual choices, and that they are as good as um, as the heterosexual choices are. And uh, that is, you know, the, these, uh, we may think, you know, that a distribution of wealth is so difficult, but the struggle for recognition can be beastly difficult. But it can be done. Because you know they have made progress, obviously the homosexuals, you know, and I think women have made progress as well. We've got about twenty minutes. Okay, then we have to stop that, right? Okay, so we have come to that point. There we have the readings. There still we have Tarkheimer's uh, critical sociology that will help us. We had also the word religions in the public sphere. The public sphere is important. Then we still have to next time whatever you want to do. We have to, you too. Do you want to do it today? Yes. Okay, then you do it today. Then we do it right away, right? I need to take a break for a minute. Um, okay, let's take a break and then <coughs> you can have your here, right? So. One minute left in the first. Let me see.
By the way, um, I wanted to mention to you, Lukacs there, I just found something. He was an unbelievably productive person. I met his group in Budapest. I went there once. So let me see who is who is here today. Let me look again for that. Don't do it. Alta Mimi, yes sir. So you are here, right?
even though he detaches it from the, the sexuality uh, emphasis that Freud has. And he says there's basically uh, five, five, right, five stages for uh, reaching the human conditions, uh, or for human, the, the human condition to reach its full potential. And this would be what society should be driving for. Our sanctioned society will uh, reinforce these human potentials and then improve them. Um, and the first of these is, is union with others. And so you have to, and what he means by this is you have to sort of work on learning how to love. And it's not only learn, loving other others, which is important, but you have to learn to uh, uh, love yourself. And you have to have this love occur on equal ground. So love is not necessarily a, 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 a power relationship. And, and he says there's two, there's, there's two sort of constructions of love that, that we have in our societies that don't do this. The first is love based on power, and he uses Don Juan as his, his sort of marking of this. And this idea of love is that you know you you make other people love you, but then you don't give any love back, and so it's the power position, in which is a game in which you try to accumulate love. So this is not equal love. And the other um, form of love that doesn't that is does not uh, corn, uh, doesn't help for human con potential is this dependence love, in which you. So it's the opposite in which you pursue somebody and they give you identity and they give you meaning and you attach yourself to them sort of like a, you know, that they're a host and you're, something's feeding off of that. And he says, most of these loves create unequal systems and they, they, they do not represent uh, real love. So um, society, if it's sane, should be moving towards a, a construction of love that's based upon equality in which people have an equal uh, representation. The second uh, stage of for human potential is uh, transcendent, um, and that he argues that people have to produce outside of themselves. And this means he do, and, and he argues that we need to do this creatively. We need to, you know, whether it's art or music or uh, constructing writing, things like that. We have to construct, and we have to be we sort of transcend our, our uh, physical reality, our you know, our beast stage of eating, sex, and, and sleeping. Uh, so we have to be moved beyond that. Um, and he says there's two versions of, of transcendence. One's creative, and this is the positive, this is the good, we should be moving towards creation. The other is the destruction, um, which is, means you try and tear down what other people have done, and this is sort of a negative uh, transcendence. And he says, so in uh, an ideal society, a sane society, we are moving towards people being creative uh, and creating things, not necessarily destruction, and not necessarily the other, which is idleness, where you don't do anything at all, you just consume. Um, the third issue is this rudeness, and he he, uh, he attaches this through the originally through the mother-child relationship, um, and he picks up Freud again here. So he drops the sort of Oedipus uh, sexual uh, construction that Freud has. He, he says that's not actually important. But through this mother-child relationship, we we learn to connect ourselves not only to our mother, but we also learn how to connect ourselves to our family, to kin, to society, to our past. We have to have this understanding of where we came from, and it, it, it ends up sounding very uh, dialectical. We have to understand this, you know, the, you, you talked about, you know, have to understand philosophy, you have to understand religion to get understand where we are now. So he says we have to, we have to create this, um, um, uh, this, this connection to the past. And he ends up uh, highly praising the sort of uh, romantic importance of the matriarchy attachment and how important that is to construction, not only the fruitness, but then it also gets tied to love um, and how we, how we, we do that. Um, the fourth stage is the identity stage, and this, again, goes to uh, that construction of, uh, of recognition um, that you've talked about. And so we have to, what we have to do is we have to construct an identity in which we are able to define who we are. Um, and uh, from where he uh, argues that we have to sort of form a true identity, a true representation. And then sanity occurs when you have um, uh, you have this illusion of identity. And, and he critiques our society particularly. He says, you know, this, we create this idea that we're independent people, but then we just conform. Uh, to what is expected of us. So the, 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 the problem is this, this concept of conformity. Identity should be something formed independently. And we can't do that, then we have problems. Um, the fifth uh, form of human potential is this construction of uh, frame of orientation. Um, 
in which we are we have to learn a way to construct our uh, to comprehend the things around us. And so from our use that we know we're going to have this sort of rationality of how we exist. We we rationalize our, our the way we think and our actions. Um, but the same society, what this should mean was that we we reaffirm humanity. We should reaffirm you know others. We should reaffirm this stuff. Um, and in the same society, what you would see is it works against humanity. And it works to undermine others. And it, so your rationale, you this, you're talking about, you know, this. Oh, I'm I'm religious, but I'm willing to have the people in the ghetto. I'm willing to go bomb countries into the ground. This sort of would be uh, what Trump is going with this frame of orientation. We we have that. Oh, I'm good. I'm a moral person, but you know, bomb them to death. That seems reasonable. Um, that's insanity to Fromm. Um and so, and, and so fundamentally, again, uh, from our use of the same society, he would reaffirm these five things. And he looks at current Western society, and again, it's 56, uh, he, he's going, um, we've moved away from these, um, and we've moved, that, that society doesn't necessarily reaffirm these five potential. And he says it's done differently. So the traditional way this is, has repressed um, these five potentials through repressive power. I mean, we, so you use coercive violence and you use fear and you use all these intimidation factors. He says, looking out there right now, what we see is the problem is, is, is anonymous authority, uh, or, or, or uh, yeah, oh yeah, the anonymous, anonymous authority of conformity is the phrase he uses. It's this idea that uh, you know now it's not you know the state saying you have to do this. It's oh you know I have to keep up with my neighbor. I have to you know buy a car that's similar. I have to have these similar goals, and that this conformity issue that pushes us. Um, becomes sort of the authority that keeps us in place. Um, we have to fit in. We, 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 we move to hide differences between other people. And so he has this comparison. I think he, he stole from Adelie Stevens, and he says, you know, it's not concerned with slavery, but becoming robots. And he has this sort of image of us being sort of robotic in our nature. Um, and he pinpoints some of the reasons for these occurrence, like uh, mass production, um, the, ability, the industrial revolution, the ability to move towards mass productions, makes accumulation easier, but it has this sort of contradictory effect where it also attempts to limit wants. So we are able to purchase any number of things, uh, any number of items, but, um, but we, we then go out and we search for buying items that resemble other items. So you think about, you know, even people that buy, uh, you know, you go and you buy a, a a Van Gogh print because it reminds you of something you saw in the gallery one time instead of actually going and trying to find new creative art that's you know unique in its vision you go and you show oh I want to reproduce this because this is you know what other people like people will be able to identify it so it all works to sort of um, to, to, to keep us actually from really uh, moving towards unique creative processes um, and he ties this back to Marx and alienation and this concept of detaching from cells, other environments, and this movement that we re replace these, uh, we replace a constructed identity to one that comes from these things. So we see, to see ourselves based off on the products we have, you know, sort of you know, fight club where they go, oh, I, have, I own this table, and this is me, and I own this couch, and this is me, and so these things um, uh, are what identify us. And he has this argument that we. Uh, you know, we work as drones and an economic system striving for more because it allows us to purchase more to identify ourselves. Um, and, and so we're losing this, um, we're losing this construction that, you know, we should be increasing these uh, five human potentials. Um, um, da, 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 da. And again, he talks about you know uh, public opinion. I feel I apologize. I sort of came repetitive in my notes. I feel like so I'm going to skip ahead again. It's big, big on conformity, big on isolated worldview. So we we hidden ourselves away from the reality. Um, and and he argues that what we have to move to is he, he says what we should we need is sort of a, a, a communitive socialism based on humanism. Um, and he argues again because of this time period, we don't see this in both the democratic West and the, the, social, the, the communist uh, uh, East. Um, both those things push for heavy structures. They push for bureaucratic structure that force us to sort of um, move to, to, to limit our options, even when it may appear that we have real identity. So he wants to 
to push for this decentralized, un less bureaucratic structure um, that would allow us to emphasize this human potential. And so he, he, he really ends up arguing, arguing that, uh, you know, both the, the communism as it appears under Stalin and the, the, the Western capitalism sort of are both giant seekers of control over the population and that they're both uh, undermining this. And we have to move away from this uh, larger hierarchy structure that sort of uh, limits our actual options. I think that's all I want to say. Very good, very good, thank you. The uh, one thing, um, you know, when we talk about saying or so, mm -hmm. then, I mean, that has to do with in individuals. So we go to the state hospital and people are insane. And it has something to do with their organism, with <coughs> chemical imbalances. Or so it's not really the intellect or the will or so. It is something between the body and and the psyche or the body and, and subject. And it was amazing that in the Hegel system, for instance, mental illnesses appear under under the organism and appear, you know, in the in terms of the genus process and. Um, aging and, and, and so on, and there uh, are also these illnesses then. And I think a lot of our psychiatrists who give us pills and so on uh, also place, you know, uh, insanity in, into the organism there, uh, into chemical imbalances, and then they give us, uh, you know, pills in order to stabilize and so on. So, but can one use the concept now of sanity or insanity and apply it to society? Is there an analogy between the two? Um, how can we really talk about not only an insane individual, but also an insane society? I think Fromm argues that we can. I mean, Fromm yeah. argues that you know the the uh, they're both driving goals, and if your your society is driving goals that go against these sort of universal constructions of of human, if you have a if you have a, a, a real human potential or something, and the society is moving you against those goals. Your society is sort of forcing you to act insanely, and it may appear as sanity, but your your actions undermine your whole society. All right? Could we say that uh, you know an illness is when an organism is in contradiction with itself <laughs> in a certain sense, right? And then we have shock therapy. We uh, give uh, poisons even, you know, to shock the organism in order to come home to itself, to become identical with itself again. Can one say the same thing of society, that an uh, insane society is one which uh, works against itself all the time, which is characterized by contradictions, and if we can uh, reconcile these contradictions, then we will have a healthy society, which would be, you know, how kind of the reconciled society. So in these antagonisms, which we have on our old map there, if you get some of them at least to reconcile them, that would contribute to make our society healthier, you know, and what makes it sick are these antagonisms, so class antagonisms, or forms of alienation, you know, if you want to take the, the Marxist thing. And, and Marx with freedom, you know, for Hegel and Marx is uh, society when you're not alienated, or alienation is the opposite of freedom. And uh, freedom means to come home to oneself in solidarity with the others. If you don't have a solidarity, people cannot come home to themselves, and then they are narcissistic. It's a whole society of narcissism, or you know what the Greeks called ho idiotes. Ho idiotes was the bourgeois, the atom, the individual guy. You know the narcissus. Obviously, this then Don Juan, and Don Juan, uh, you know, he can go out to the others unlike Nazis, but he cannot come back to himself. He gets hooked out there and, uh, you know, runs from one woman to the other, 400 there, 4,000 there, and, and never comes home to himself again, so. Okay, could we, can we say it that way? That we can use, you know, a word which really uh, belongs to medicine and to psychology and, and can also apply that analogically to a society. And the analogy would be, you know, that the individual is in opposition to itself and can only be healed by medicine, which overcomes that, even by using electricity or whatever. And the society is the same thing. Society, it's not 
identical with itself. It's not at home with itself. It, it's torn, torn, as uh, Hannes would say, torn apart in itself. Okay, very good. That's all for today. So we have one more meeting. Tell your friends, right, so that we are meeting once more, and we have two more papers, I hope, the next time. Very good. Tell them that you missed the next